program for us that you'll find in the labs directory. And it is called arbright.c. And basically what arbright does is you pass it two command line arguments, so you invoke it like arbright a a a b b b b. And it takes these two command line arguments. Actually, I think that back actually takes three. And um, it tries to set the, the pointer, of the first command line argument, it interprets this as a pointer that the like, process address space, some type of pointer. And it tries to set that pointer value equal to the second command line argument. So in this case, it tries to set OX414141 equal to OX424242, uh, since 424242 is B. And then eventually these C's will just be your shell code. Just putting your shell code on the third command line argument. And um, luckily in this case, I tell you what the address is of where your third command line argument is. So we don't have to go digging through the debugger where your shell code is located in memory. And you can see basically, I'm uh, interpreting those first two command line arguments as pointers, pointer one and pointer two. And I'm trying to set pointer one, A, 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 equal to a pointer two, B, 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 B. So what we could do is set, um, if we made A, 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 like a return address, the return address for the main function, and set it equal to uh, the address of our shellcode, then obviously our shellcode would execute. But there's a lot of other things you can change in memory besides the return address to gain control of EIP. As you can probably imagine, if you can change any four bytes of memory in a process, there's like a lot of different ways you can gain control of EIP. There's lots of function pointers floating around, and you can overwrite those and uh, other sort of important things that are eventually used to uh, control the EIP. And we're going to talk about some of those to overwrite some of them. And I'm going over this because in exploitation, you often get into a scenario where you can arbitrarily change four bytes of memory. It's a pretty common scenario. You're corrupting something like a, a C++ virtual table, and it allows you to uh, basically just like change four bytes of memory, something like that. So. Just to give you an example, um, you'll want to compile arbright with GCC, so like so. Oops. Yeah. You won't have that issue. And you can see I get all of these warnings, basically a warning for each line of my code because I'm doing like the nastiest C programming ever to implement this. You know, programming an application that is uh, supposed to overwrite its own memory, it will obviously will cause some issues. Uh, or at least the compiler is going to say, I hope you know what you're doing. And if we just run it like A, A, B, B, D, like that, we'll get a crash. Uh, unsurprising because it's trying to set, you know, Basically, if you know C, it's trying to do this operation. And since 414141 is an invalid address, we get a segmentation fault. Um, so does everyone understand what Arbyte is doing, basically, with what its purpose is and how it works? And we're going to leverage this or use this to uh, Experiment some with overriding random ranges of memory and see uh, what we can overwrite to gain control of the IP and cause our shell code to execute. Okay. So the first thing we're going to look at overriding. So the first thing we're going, like our first target for overriding, we already know about overriding the return address and. Uh, Honestly, if you can overwrite anything you want, the return address isn't the best option because sometimes they're kind of hard to, uh, to locate. But there's other more static things that are even more reliable than the return address. The first thing we're going to talk about is the global offset table. And um, if you know anything about Windows, somewhat like the import address table, basically it's, it's a, a table of function pointers in the process address space that um, the table just points to where imported functions are located. So when you compile a program like Hello World, it just says printf hello world, 
at compile time, the compiler has no idea where the printf function is actually going to be located. Okay, printf is the libc, or like a DLL of Windows, the shared library that contains the, lib, the uh, printf function is loaded at runtime. Is everyone familiar with this sort of like process loading type of uh, functionality? Um, so you know, otherwise if you did do that, every time you write hello world, it would have to stat statically link the entire libc to your simple hello world program, and you would get this huge like multiple megabytes size uh, library attached to your four line piece of C code. So it's not efficient to just add in the printf code to everything. So instead, the compiler says, okay, I have no idea where printf is going to be. So instead, at runtime, I'm just going to use this global offset table to discover its actual location. And when the, when the process actually loads, the operating system is going to come in, attach the printf code via a shared library to, um, to the process. It's kind of like loading a DLL in Windows. And then the operating system loader is also going to come into this global offset table and fix up the global offset table to say, OK, uh, printf is actually located at OX B7, F, D, whatever, whatever, whatever. So if you were to look at like a C program, And you add something like a, a call to printf, like printf stuff. If you look at the underlying assembly in a debugger, you would actually see something like, and I'm simplifying a little bit, a call, say like got. Zero. So I like call the zeroth entry of the global offset table. Or if you had something like, you know, str copy, blah, 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 you'll see call got one. Because, uh, you know, printf is contained as the zeroth entry of the global offset table, and um, STR copy is the first entry of the global offset table. And um, that way, we do not have to have the actual string copy or printf code in our simple application. These are just in the shared library that gets loaded at runtime. And if you were to look at the global offset table and at, uh, at compile time, you would see that these entries are basically 0 equals OX 0 0 0 equals OX 0 0 0. But then, when you actually invoke the program, dot slash program, the operating system does a lot of stuff. And one of these things is, OK, I see that you rely on, print, on the uh, standard libc library that provides string copy and printf. So I'm going to load that into your address space. Automatically, just going to force that into your address space. And then I'm going to come to your global offset table and say, OK, I put libc at OX v 7 1,000 or something like that. And um, since I know you're using string copy and printf, I'm going to come to your global offset table and set this actually equal to where these are located in your process address space. How does everyone feel about that? Does that kind of make sense? So in Windows, um, these are we're talking about like uh, DLLs, like um, user 32.dll and so forth that get automatically added to your process address space when your program runs. And with Linux, we're talking about things like the standard uh, libc library. So if you didn't do this, you would have to statically link the application and you would have to um, you know, have the actual printf code in your binary, and then your simple hello world binary would be like multiple megabytes big instead of it being like four kilobytes. Uh, because everyone just shares that same pool of code instead of having that have, instead of having to have that same pool of code attached to every binary. So always think about the design decisions for why people do things these ways. It just helps you remember them. 
So instead, we're actually calling through, you know, indirectly calling through this global offset table. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to tell Arbrite to overwrite its global offset table. So we're going to overwrite the global offset table associated with printf, global offset table zero or something like that. And instead of it pointing to a legitimate libc address, OXP7, EF, blah, 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 we're going to make it point to our shell code, OXBFF, something, something, something. So once we perform this arbitrary overwrite, um, when would our shell code actually get executed? Whenever we call printf. The next time we call printf. Next time we call printf, it's going to try to call through that global offset table again, and then um, bam, it's going to execute our shell code instead. So let's do that. So we can actually look at the global offset table and its um, its contents using the uh, obj dump command again. So if you fire up your virtual machine and do obj dump dash capital R, I don't want you guys to write down, we'll be using that a few times, then the program name Arbright is basically telling you the contents of the global offset table, or not actually, I shouldn't say the contents of the global offset table, or where the global offset table is actually located. So in this case it's saying the global offset table entry for printf is located at 804967C. Um, the global offset table for puts is located at 8049680, and the global offset table entry for exit is at blah 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 684. And you can see these are you know like contiguous in memory as well, 7C8084, and so on. Um, notice so that it doesn't know what the con the actual contents of these uh, entries are. That's because they're all basically zero at this point the operating system hasn't come in and filled out those values. It's just looking at the, uh, the binary on disk. Okay, so um, here's a question for you guys. If we can arbitrarily change four bytes of memory, why not just change the, uh, the next instruction to be you know, a jump to our shellcode or something like that? Why wouldn't that work? Yeah? Um, because four bytes is only enough to jump to those sections, kind of right? Uh, it could be. You do a short jump. You can't do it because the text segment where your code is, code is, it's read only. If you tried to change your own code, it would cause a segmentation fault because your code is marked as read only. You can't do this crazy poly polymorphic stuff as your code is running unless you do some pretty gnarly stuff. Um, so it has to be memory we can change that will allow us to gain control of EIP, but it also has to be writable. Okay, we also have, actually have to be able to write to it. The global offset table by design has to be writable because the operating system has to come in and fix up these values for us. It's expected that they're gonna change. So, when we're looking for these targets to when we have like an arbitrary four byte overwrite, it has to be writable and it has to eventually lead to control of EIP. Okay, so um, if we look at the global offset table and the corresponding source code for the uh, the application, we can see that. Uh, there's an exit, you know, because we're actually calling exit, so it creates an entry for it. And there's a printf, because we're calling printf. But there's a couple other um, kind of confusing things. There's puts and this uh, libc start main. So to clarify, whenever you call printf and you don't pass in any additional arguments, you know, like um, the modulo x, and you're passing these additional arguments. It actually performs some optimizations. So like in this case, we're, um, we're only printfing a string. You know, there's no additional arguments. We're only printfing the string, pop a link on here by call. And um, whenever you do something like that, it actually performs an optimization. It just calls puts instead of printf. The compiler is doing that, just because it's a little bit faster. And uh, these other functions you see, like libc start main and so forth, um, these are 
implicitly called by your program and you just don't see them in the source code, the compiler is basically just putting them in there because main actually is not the first thing to be called in your program, just part of the way the, uh, the Linux operating system is working. So those are just a couple things to keep in mind. But obviously you see that you're using printf and exit, so those appear in the global offset table. So what we're going to try to do is overwrite one of um, these global offset table entries with the address of our shell code and then get our shell code to execute. So first off, you need to get a copy of your shell code in this directory so you, you have it uh, close by to use. So I have mine right here. Already use. Okay, so um, that's my shell code, ex exec the E, then SH. Corey, if we change the GOT table, doesn't that mean that any other function that we have running will also suffer? No, because you're only changing the global offset table um, for the, uh, that particular function. It only affects the one function. So every, every process creates its own GOT table? Yes, every process, every executable has its own global yeah, offset And they just table. copy a main one somewhere? Because I assume that the, the copy of libc stuff is the same for everybody, right? Yes, but they can't do like a common copy for everyone because libc can potentially be loaded at different addresses for each process. Isn't that a functional Linux, though? No? Um, is it a, are you asking, is it a function of Linux to load things in different addresses, or to have everything, to have like I a common global offset table? I thought to have a common table. global offset table. It, I mean, because I guess it is, wouldn't it assume that every process might need something, and so it would have it loaded up ahead of time, or? Guess not. Um, basically, just by design, you have to do it on a per process basis because every process is going to be different. And um, each process might have libc look at a different address. So, like, hello world might have libc loaded at OX B7 1000. And my um, basic Vuln application might have libc located at OX B7 2000, and so on. You just can't make any assumptions about where libc is going to be loaded loaded in your process address space. So, um, and it's loaded for each process. So it can be different for each process, so you have to do the global offset table on But as a coder, process. I don't have to do that. I just assume Linux is going to load that for me, right, I guess? Yeah, you just assume that it's going to load it for you. That's correct. But you have no idea as a programmer where it's going to be loaded. You're relying on the operating system and its um, process loader to go in and fix up all those uh, global offset table values for your process at runtime. Does that clear things up at all, or is there I, more I, things I, that I you're think I, um, I think I get it now. Are, uh, I know it's a little bit confusing. It's just, you know, um, yeah, it's hard for me to explain it without relating it to like Windows and how they do it the exact same way with the import address table and DLLs, but then I'm not really explaining the issue, I'm just relating it to something. So I know I know it's confusing. Um, but just know that the global offset table is a per process thing. Each process has its own unique global offset table. <coughs> okay. So everyone has a copy of their shell code in the labs directory. And uh, we're going to use ArmWrite to execute some shell code. So let's overwrite the, um, the global offset table for printf. All right. So first, my first argument is what I want to overwrite. 
So I'm going to put in the address for the printf global offset table. And we're going to do this backwards because so we're in Little Indian world. So you can see I'm just First argument is um, the address of what we want to overwrite, 0804967C. Remember also that I'm not doing some kind of system-wide change or system-wide back. I'm forcing Arbrite. Arbrite is programmed to you know, change itself in this really contrived way, just for uh, you know, example's sake. And so we're forcing Arbrite to uh, change its printf global offset table when it's loaded this time based on the arguments we're passing it. And um, what do we want to set? What should the second command line argument be? What do we want to set printf equal to? Yeah, starting location will be shelter. Right, and which is what right now? We don't know. So for now, I'm just going to put in some placeholder values, b, 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 b. And we'll go and figure out where our shellcode is in a second. And then the third command line argument is just going to be our shellcode. We're just going to dump our shellcode in the command line. That way we, uh, we have it in the process address space somewhere. Because it turns out that anything we put on the command line actually ends up in the uh, process address space, even if it's not popped into a buffer or something. So, So there we go. First command line argument is the address of printf. <coughs> Second argument is the placeholder value. I put four Bs as um, the address is four bytes long, just like the placeholder value for now. Um, using these placeholder values is important because if the size of your command line arguments change, things will move around in memory a little bit. Okay, And that's also why I went ahead and put the shell code on the command line. Um, as a third argument, cat bin shellcode. You can use your hello world shellcode or your own custom developed shellcode. In fact, I encourage you to do that. Um, and notice this tells us that the third command line argument is located at OXBF FF F770. The third command line argument is the address is our shellcode. Because um, first command line argument, second command line argument, third command line argument. I basically just programmed our right to tell us the address of the third command line argument to make our lives easier, so it automatically just tell us where the shelter is located. So, if we change these four bytes of Bs to an actual 32-bit address of our shellcode, OXPFFF770, um, we'll see what happens. So I overwrote the global offset table with, associated with printf. I overwrote it with the address of my shellcode so that the next time printf should be called, it um, should execute my shellcode, but my shellcode was not actually executed. If we look at the uh, Arbrite source code, We can see that the actual arbitrary overwrite occurs right here. Pointer 1 equals pointer 2. And the reason the shellcode was not executed was because this actually is not a printf call. This is a puts call because of that optimization I told you about. So we overwrite print, we overwrite the printf global offset table, but um, printf was never called again. So our shellcode was never executed. So what I want you guys to do is try some of those other um, global offset table entries that you find with the obj-r command and see which ones actually execute your shellcode. So try, for instance, the puts global offset table, the exit global offset table, and you can even try some of those libc ones if you want. Okay, so for those of you that have uh, worked through this, did anyone try um, gmon start? Unreal confidence inspiring. Did anyone try either of these like loopsy things like start main? Yeah, it probably wouldn't work. So, um, so printf, did that work? Shellcode? No. Puts, did that work? Exit? Okay. Yep. 
So, um, the global offset table is one uh, entity that is commonly leveraged. Um, that's commonly leveraged when you like uh, have an arbitrary four byte override to get your shell code to execute. Um, which did you get the uh, your shell code to execute on any of those? Okay, uh, which entry were you trying? Were you trying the puts one? 0.049680. That one should definitely work. And so to use that one, you would do something like I know what my address is yet. I'm just putting a placeholder value in. And I'm replacing that placeholder value with the, uh, the address of argv3 bffff770. We're right, doing it backwards, it's a little Indian. There you go, that should work. Okay, so we're going to talk about another um, target we can use that's used in Linux, and it's um, the destructor table, which is basically just uh, a table of function pointers that are called whenever a process is being uh, torn down by the operating system. So Linux, or GCC in particular, has this handy feature where you can register a, um, a list of function pointers to be called whenever your program exits, if you need to like clean up some memory or do some logging or something like that. And whenever the program is getting torn down and exiting, the operating system will just automatically go through and call all those functions that are on that list. So if we put our shell code on that list, our shell code will get called when the program is uh, exiting. Okay. And so you can investigate the destructor by um, using this command, obj dump again, obj, obj dump dash s dash j dot detours, which is what that list of uh, function pointers is called, and then the binary name rwrite. And you can see uh, what this means. Usually no one uses this kind of like obscure, weird feature. You know, no one actually uses this in practice. It just exists for whatever reason. And right now it's telling us the list is uh, empty. FFFFF signifies this is the start of the list. And then the first entry is just zero, so no entries. So I want you guys to try to um, overwrite the destructor with the address of your shellcode and get it to execute. It's not going to work right away. Um, and I want you guys to play with it a little bit and reason about the, uh, the values here. So if you just overwrite the Fs, it won't work. Because the Fs are there to signify the, uh, the beginning of the list. So if they're not all Fs, then uh, the operating system won't try to process the list. So instead, you'll have to Try to write like the zero is going to be instead of the s. And so the zeros would be at this address plus some offset. Sorry, can you explain that again? So the detours is just something that's tagged on at the end of any GCC. Yeah. But and those three addresses are destruction. So these aren't addresses. It's this is saying the uh, destructor is located. The destructor list is located at this address, 8049590. These, this is the contents. Okay. The uh, the first entry is FF, 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 and that just means this is the start of the list, just like sanity checking values. 
And then the first entry in the list is 0, 0, 0, 0, which means the end of the list. So right now, the list is empty. And in fact, if you do this command on most Linux binaries, you'll see this is empty because no one really uses this feature, except hackers and buyers developers. So what will happen is if you try to override 8049590, it won't work because then you'll be overriding the sanity checking values that, 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 and the operating system won't try to process the list. So instead, you have to override 0, 0, 0, you know, these zeros, which is at 8049590 plus 4, 4. Right, so you need to overwrite 8049590 because that's where the zeros are at. The Fs are at 9, 0, 0, 0, 9, 4. That makes sense? Yeah. Their shell code executing with the destructor hit. For those of you that have already gotten those, um, I'm going to let people work on this for like uh, five more minutes. I challenge you to try to overwrite the return address with Arbright. The return address of me with Arbright with the address of your shell code. To try to get it to work that way. So here's something to be aware of when you have like an arbitrary four byte override situation. Let's say this is the program that we're exploiting. Our arbitrary four byte override happens up here, pointer one plus pointer two. We're just assuming that we've corrupted and somehow control these values. And this is some real application. And then um, you know there's some logic in here. Then a hundred lines later, we have an f print f statement. A hundred lines more code, screen copy. 1,000 lines, more code, exit zero. Which global offset table should I choose if I want to write the most reliable exploit possible? You would want to write, overwrite the F printf global offset table. The reason is the program would have to survive long enough without crashing to reach this F printf statement. If you have performed a buffer overflow and have corrupted a whole bunch of crap on the stack or the heap, it's possible that when you're accessing one of those values, you will cause a crash. You corrupted some local pointer that can be used for exploitation, but it's still dereferenced, and it causes a crash. So you need to get your shellcode executing as soon as possible because you have put the program in an unstable state. So you want to make that shellcode happen uh, as quickly as possible after you've uh, performed you know, the, uh, the overwrite. So chances are there's a thousand lines of code and you've corrupted a whole bunch of local variables. There's no way you're going to get to the end of the function without crashing before, you're, uh, you know, before your shell code starts to execute. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, when we're trying to develop reliable exploits, you, know, you have to sometimes survive long enough to get to the return address or something like that to get to the return. And if you corrupted a whole bunch of local variables, you know, you might have caused it to program to become unstable and crash. If it just crashes, you'll never get to your shellcode execution. Do you guys get the, uh, the destructors uh, executing your shellcode? Okay. Anyone get the return address executing your shellcode? Uh, so the return address is always yeah. right above the EDP? Yes. Is it always contiguous? Yes. So if you, if you just subtracted 32 from the EBP, if you knew the EBP and you subtracted... Uh, it should be EBP plus 4. Okay. Because at EBP, pointing the EBP is the uh, old stage frame pointer. And then right above that, so 4 bytes later, since that's a 32 bit value, is the return address. And that's just the architecture standard. That's the way the, the Intel architecture is working in x86.
Um, occasionally, you will see like um, brainless functions that don't use EDP. I actually see that in X64 a lot, where EDP is not used at all. And uh, that is sometimes just done with some crazy compiler optimization um, when it uses heuristics to deem that that is uh, more efficient than actually setting up a stack frame. But you don't really see that in x86, only when you're talking about x64. Okay. Uh, remote guys like Butch and Debbie, did you guys get um, your shell code executing with the uh, ArmWrite program? With uh, the destructor in the ArmWrite program? Okay, so let me uh, walk through that one as well. So first of all, we want to um, figure out what address we're trying to overwrite. So like I told you guys, this is the address of the destructor, but we actually want to overwrite the zeros, not the Fs, since those have to, those Fs have to be there as like a sanity check from the operating system. So instead of, we want to overwrite 8049594, since this is four bytes long, four more bytes will get us into those zeros. So the first address is the address of what we want to change, which is that uh, destructor's address. Placeholder values. My shell code. And I see that my shell code is located at OX BF FF F770. write the destructor and then when the exit call happens and the uh, process is being torn down, the operating system sees that there is this address in the um, destructor's list and it says, okay, um, the program must register the destructor to be called to clean up some memory or do some logging or something like that, so I'm going to call that. But lo and behold, it is actually our shell code and our shell code gets executed at the end of the program's execution. So. Um, like I was just explaining, where you have to make the program survive long enough to execute your shell code, you know, when choosing what you want to overwrite. Sometimes the destructor is hard to use because it only gets called when the program is exiting. And that might be, uh, you know, far away in proximity, the, the place in code where the program exits compared to the place where you corrupted everything. So this would really only be a good option is if you could do perform your corruption and it cause the program to uh, exit. Um, soon afterwards. Otherwise, we'll probably end up crashing the application before you get to the normal termination of the program. If you just call the segmentation fault, the destructor list will not be full. How's everyone feel about that? Okay. Is everyone ready to hack Corey's crappy allocator? Charles, did you figure out how? Um, you would cause that arbitrary four byte overwrite? I think so. Okay, I want to try explaining. Um, so it gets to the point where it sets the previous point in the next part and the next to the previous. Yeah, um, the unlink operation that I was drawing up there. And if you set one of the pointers to the value that you want to change and the other pointer to the value that you want it to have, then it'll assign that value to what you provide it. Yes. So, uh, like Charles was just describing, we get to a point when we're going to uh, unlink that chunk from the free list and we're removing it from the free list and we do something like this, next pointer, previous pointer equals uh, previous pointer, and then um, next pointer, previous pointer, next pointer equals next pointer. So we control at this point next pointer and previous pointer because we have overflowed and corrupted those values. In your examples, you probably overwrote them with AAAAA, 414141. 
So what the program essentially tried to do was said, like a lifespan of like an hour or something. There we go. Sure. It's trying to set 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1 equal to 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1. Uh, 4, 1 is 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1. So those addressed, so that comes as your crash. But you know that you control next pointer and previous pointer. So let's forget about this for now. Before we venture into this, I'll say it's probably the hardest lab in the class. So prepare yourselves. There will be lots of twists and turns. The excitement that is Corey's crappy allocator. But um, we know that we control next pointer and previous pointer because of our heap corruption. Everyone with me on that? This line of code gets executed in the unlinked chunk function, which says the next pointer equals to previous pointer. We control both those pointers, so we have an arbitrary or byte memory overwrite, because we control the destination of the overwrite and the value that it's being overwritten with. If we set next pointer equal to the global offset table, and this equal to our shell code, then we will set the global offset table equal to our shell code, and then eventually our shell code will execute. There's a couple nuances here, though. First off, we have, we're not just setting next pointer equal to previous pointer, okay? We're setting next pointer arrow previous pointer equals previous pointer. Who in here is a wizardly C programmer and can tell me the implications of this operator? It's accessing a field and a structure after referencing. Yes. So if the address of next pointer was 1,000, what would the end result of the uh, address be after this operator is applied? Depends what that structure is. If yes. It is in the so structure size, what size? Good job. Yeah, good job. Most, most classes struggle with that concept. So let's go back and look at the yeah, contents of um, that control block structure that that pointer is referencing. This is something you're going to want to keep on a piece of paper since we'll be accessing or using this field. You want to know exactly how it is laid out. So this structure looks like a control block. We have int. Pointer, so I'm just going to say void to make it less to right. Void next. And I'm just simplifying here. The names are exactly the same. Void previous. Make that more clear. Next free. Previous free. Okay. So. This is our control block structure. Let's assume we have a control block pointer. So I'm just going to say CB control block pointer, pointer, and let's say our pointer is pointing at a control block located at address OX1, 
thousand. This is just the address and memory of where the control block is located. So that's what pointer is equal to right now, right? Because these pointers are just pointing at locations in memory. So right now, control block is located at OX one thousand. So that is what our pointer is equal to. If we do CD avail, what address am I talking about? If I say CB next free, What address is that? 1,000 uh -huh. And then previous free? Oh. No. Nope. Trick question. Yeah, C. Yeah. So 1,000 C. Okay, good. So you guys understand that concept. So um, when we do something like next. Pointer equals, or next pointer. Previous pointer equals previous. In the time that our corruption happens, let's say we have overridden next pointer with 41414141. We are basically doing 4141. Or one, or one plus uh, C. Uh, no, plus yeah, plus C. That's right. Plus C O X C equals O X four one four one four one four one. So, what address do we need? to corrupt the next pointer field with. So be global offset table minus OXC. Okay, so we want to override next pointer with global offset table minus OXC. That way when this plus C gets tacked on, the net result is zero. And we're basically saying global offset table equals address of our shell code or whatever. People look mystified there. How does everyone know what it That kind of makes sense? I know if you're not familiar with like C structures, this will come across as a little bit weird. But you just have to remember that this operator is basically just adding some offset onto um, this pointer, and you control that pointer. So in this case, it's adding an offset of OXC because it's the uh, plus 0, plus 4, plus 8, plus C member of that structure, and then setting it equal to another value that you control. So your challenge is to take your crash from the memory heap allocator and turn it into something that executes your shell code. So this will be pretty hard, and there will be um, you know, some struggles along the way and some things I haven't quite told you about yet, but I want you to try to discover them on your own. But I think you guys have a pretty good grasp of this material, so hopefully you'll do well. Um, so yeah, you can, I'll let you choose your own target, what you pick in the global offset table, or you can pick the destructor, or try to pick a return address or something like that. It's totally up to you. And you want to try to override the address of your shell code. What I will say is that if in your crash, you are using small allocation sizes, like just 10 bytes or something like that for the chunks you are creating. I suggest you adjust those to be bigger, like 128 bytes, so that they are big enough to hold your shell code. Because it will be easier for you if you put your shell code on the heap, so you want your uh, heap chunks to be big enough to score that shell code. So if you make them like 128 bytes each, that's probably best. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys start on this for like, uh, I want you to just work on it 15 minutes without me giving you too much help because I want you guys to see, I want to see how much you guys can get figured out. Then after a while, I'll start feeding you more and more hints and working you through the process of exploiting it. 
and then right when you think you've got everything set up, you will discover that it still doesn't work. And I'm curious to see who can debug that fun little issue. Um, so yeah, if you think you have everything figured out and it's crashing, um, no surprise there. As I sort of expect that will happen. Some of you will get lucky and you won't get that crash. Another thing you want to think about is when you're corrupting your control block meta information, what do I want all of these values to be set to? All right, you're not just corrupting the next and the previous pointers. You're also corrupting the available and the size fields. So if you corrupt this and set the size equal to zero, then your exploit is going to fail because the heap allocator is going to say the size is too small, so I'm not even going to consider processing these next and previous pointers. Or it might consider processing, but it's certainly not going to unlink it from the list and then cause the arbitrary 4 byte overwrite. So you have to be intelligent with what you over corrupt all the values with. It's also similar if you have something like a stack overflow, you often corrupt a lot more things than just you know, the buffer you're overflowing. In a return address, you often smack all kinds of local variables on your uh, war path to the return address. And it's oftentimes you have to be clever with what you overwrite those values with as well. That way you can uh, keep the program ex uh, executing and stable long enough to actually get that return address and get yourself good to execute.